I have been privileged on the Oxendine for oh, about seven or so years, ever since uh, my young son went out to graduate school at Stanford out there, and very pleased that the uh, faculty congregation where he could attend. So we've had a, 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 a association since that time, and and found that uh, Johnny would be a, an excellent gospel preacher. Of course, when Keith went out there, we uh, told Johnny, he said, uh, you are obligated to find Keith a wife. And as a matchmaker, Johnny is an excellent gospel preacher. <laughs> he was born in uh, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, graduated from the, the University of North Carolina. Uh, Carolina system, baptized 1977, been a member of San Mateo Church ever since that time. He married the former uh, Hackworth, which makes him the son-in-law of Noah Hackworth. Now, I, I don't have any sympathy for you. I mean, you, you made that choice. But uh, got two children, Leslie. She's a, she's a beautiful young lady. She's a college sophomore at Mills College in Oakland, and then Andrew, or Drew, he's a freshman. Freshman? How can that be? He was just, how did it happen? A full-time preacher at San Mateo for 11 years now, and uh, uh, stands strong. He's a great defender of truth. He's uh, spoken at various lectureships around the country, and, and uh, he has been included, he's been included in some publications. So he's a very capable man, and I'm very pleased to have him. I have enjoyed him in our home for this last uh, uh, two days, so we'll uh, certainly look forward to hearing him speak tonight on the subject, do certain associations imply fellowship? So come speak to us, John. Brother Cohn is being nice to me because he's hoping that Keith will come back home. <laughs> With him, he's not. <laughs> As mentioned, we have our work out in the San Francisco Bay Area. If you've read anything in the book of Genesis about Sodom, then you have some idea of what we did in California, and especially in San Francisco. San Francisco, of course, is proof positive that if you eat enough Twinkies, you can get away with just about anything. <laughs> if you don't know what that refers to, some 30 years ago, there was a man who was on the city council in San Francisco. His name was Dan White. Walked into City Hall in San Francisco. He shot the homosexual city councilman and shot the mayor. He got off scot free because he said he had eaten so many Yankees he just couldn't straight. <laughs> the current mayor, another scoundrel. <laughs> He is the foremost promoter of homosexual marriage. You probably remember San Francisco for that. And he just recently, two two ago, found himself embroiled in another controversy where he had been involved in an adulterous relationship with his campaign manager's wife. Such is the area where we live. What I do want to do is to thank Brother Dove, for the mess he has started. <laughs> I want to thank David for continuing to stoke the fires. <laughs> I want to thank Brother Watson also for leaving what had been a reputable publication and has now become a Casper Milk Toast publication. I want to thank all of you, good brethren, who uh, 
in this congregation who have supported the work, who have stood fast for defense of the gospel, and who will not give up the fight. My responsibility this evening is to talk about the fellowship that we have been discussing over the last three days. The concept of fellowship in the Bible is inseparable. It is impossible to be separated from truth. And when we think of what that truth means, it means our being in a relationship with God. First Corinthians, First John, chapter one, verse three. I think about Brother Watton, and I think about the High Tower, and they took all the verses that I was going to use, but have been used over and over. So if you hear them, I may just reference them. I may not quote. But one thing is for sure, and you know this, and that is that we cannot be in fellowship with God and in fellowship with error. We were called into the relationship with God through the gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. And the seriousness of this aspect of lost souls, which we have talked about here in this lectureship, clearly the focus and reason that the brethren at Spring have decided to broach this subject straight on. And I appreciate the opportunity to also be a participant. I am honored to be here with you. I see some faces that I have seen before. I am glad to see again. And of course, the, the new faces of many of you. This notion, this notion of fellowship, somehow ubiquitous throughout the brotherhood that it does not matter for many of these brethren about one's adherence to biblical truth. And this has created an ongoing battleground. And those whom we had known in the past, many of you have known in the past, their names, of course, you have heard, you have probably seen them on lectureships, perhaps here or other places. And our small congregation in Hill, California, we, like many of you over the years, have had Brother Cates, we've had Brother Mosier, we've had Brother Garland Elkins, along with Brother Dub and Brother Brown and many others. And in some unusual way, we have found ourselves uh, having to think about the seriousness of these issues and to come down on the side that we think. Now, one thing is sure, and that is, of course, our brother, our brother Watson, uh, I believe, used it this, this afternoon. He says, you're either for me or against me. And that's a truth that we cannot avoid. When we look at the facts as they are presented, when you look at the information that is available, when you look at the information that's on the CD or the publications, it is not hard to see the truth of the matter. It is not hard to see error. And so it is disappointing to hear so many of those that we had thought before were sound now making excuses, now going with their tails between their legs trying to support trying to defend someone that they know is wrong. We cannot have fellowship with unrighteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. No matter what some brethren accept, no matter what some brethren may do, no matter what some brethren may believe, there is, as was said, no respect of person. The areas that I'm going to talk about this evening fall into three categories. One, surrounding the financial support of a work. The other, surrounding the speaking on lectureship programs. And the third, writing for brotherhood publications. Do they apply fellowship when we involve ourselves in those various instances? Is it possible to be involved? with those not be in fellowship 
with those others who are lost. Scriptures tell us, in chapter 4 and verse 2, that a steward is above all to be faithful, which means that he is in fellowship with God. He must be in fellowship with God. There is a responsibility then to do only all that which is required that which is authorized by God. That word steward, defined by scholars, of course, and as the biblical uh, show, a person who is a fiscal agent, who has a responsibility, who manages the assets of another. The master of a house puts someone in charge. He trusts a steward to administer the responsibilities properly. And we're talking about the financial support of works. We go to Luke chapter 16, and there we see that there is an expected accounting of our stewardship. It says, render the account of thy stewardship. That means our management, financial aspects of the Lord's work is paramount. There is a responsibility that has to be taken on. And I dare not say that we have seen over the years in many instances cases where the financial uh, aspect of uh, support has been abused. But we have to think about this in terms of fellowship. In Acts chapter 13, verse 2, the Holy Spirit instructs the brethren in Antioch to separate Paul and Barnabas for the upcommissionary work. Now, in doing so, of course, that means that those who were separated for that work, for that work, will only be faithful brethren. The Holy Spirit would not say separate unfaithful brethren. Work. The Holy Spirit would not say separate false brethren or false teachers for this work. And so we have those who were separated, and we ask ourselves the question, how can we do otherwise? How can we, for a work that has to be supported financially, how can we make a decision that does not take into consideration the faithfulness of those involved? How can we not then be in fellowship with that we allow to have our financial resources? In Galatians chapter 2, we're affirming uh, hands of fellowship offered there to Paul and Barnabas as they were about to preach to the Gentiles. This indicates that there is a common faith, a common goal, and a common gospel. Can he be divided? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Can he be broken into little pieces in the camps of truth and error? Scripture says that there are to be no divisions among us. There is to be a commonality. There is to be the the need for us to speak the same things, to be of the same mind, to be of the same judgment. And how can any faithful brethren be willing to do what God demands of us? That which is written, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. Some years ago in San Mateo, we were asked to consider two works, financial support one of which involved a brother Barry Hatcher at the time who was in Jakarta, Indonesia. The other was a work that was in the Philippines, a work by a gentleman by the name of Leo Corpus. In the process, of course, we did what we thought would be due to inquired about the work, who oversaw the work, which of course at this time was being overseen here, who was funding the work, which we thought was very important, who had Brother Hatcher gone to get funds. We thought that it was really important to know who had he asked for money. A lot of things, you can tell a lot of things, but what if we person asked money? So we asked about, we asked uh, other questions, how long you know, will you be looking for support? 
What kind of goals, what kind of objectives, what kind of things did you have in mind? What were you trying to, what were you trying to do? Well, we got the answers from Brother Hatcher at that time that was satisfying the and so we continued our pursuit to, to find this other work. I'm going to tell you, this was one of the more eye-opening experiences that I'd ever had. I called the people who were overseeing this particular work. I don't know anything about Norcross, north of Atlanta, Georgia, or, or somewhere around Atlanta, Georgia, but this is the congregation. If you're from Norcross, I'm so sorry. I called over there because they were supposed to be overseeing the work, a group of elders, and strange immediately when I found out that that group of elders was overseeing another group of elders. Well, I asked these brethren, I said, well, I'm, I'm calling to get some information about this Leo Corpus. You oversee the work in the Philippines. How long have you overseen this work? They said, well, for a little more than 20 years. I said, I see. I said, well, how have you been over there? Well, we haven't been. I said, I see. I said, would you tell me what Brother uh, Corpus' positions are on divorce and remarriage or maybe a few other things? He said, well, we'll give you his email. And I, said, I don't want his email. I'm asking you. You are the elders that oversee this work. You're the ones who responsible are asking for funds and directing him. I want to know what you know about Leo Corpus. Well, he said, why don't you call us back in a few more days? We'll have a little bit more information. <laughs> well, I did. I called back and they, and they, and they faxed me this, this sheet of information from Leo Corpus about the work in the Philippines. They had been giving him $3,000 a month for 20 20 years. Well, this little sheet that he sent, I'm not a mathematician, I, I don't claim to be, uh, but I knew that these figures look pretty strange. He said we're growing at a rate of 50% a year in terms of their attendance and baptisms and contributions. But they needed 10 more years of support before we reach a halfway mark on their own self-support. <laughs> Needless to say, we had not fund that work a dime. <laughs> now the other thing that was pretty strange about it is that many other congregations in the Bay Area, they had funding of that work. They had been uh, in a relationship with the congregation that, that uh, Leo Corpus was attending. They had done different things together. They were implicitly fellowship with him. We have to see. We have to see what this kind of financial support implies. If we were to fund that work, we would indeed be in fellowship with error. You say, well, how do you say that about those brethren? They may have been good brethren, just naive. Maybe they didn't know anything about uh, Leo Corpus busy with other things. Well, yes, they were. You know what they were busy with? Now, this is what really put the nail on the coffin for him. As far as our congregation was concerned, they had had over the past two years some of our noteworthy people, Jeff Walling, Buddy Bell from Mark in Montgomery somewhere, Rubel Shelley, uh, Rich Ashley, whom I understand is a Texas boy. This was, uh, this was the untouchables. And I asked myself, how could a person in our congregation ask us about funding a work like that? But you see, See, those things were not part of his thing. When it came to us, he said, well, why don't we think about this person with no idea of the congregation that oversaw that work, how liberal they were, how really uncomfortable what type of key this particular missionary was doing. They had never even been over to the Philippines. 
Now, Leo Corpus was really upset with me because of some of the bulletin articles that I wrote going up, but that's become warm in San Mateo. <laughs> And that's the kind of thing that we have to we have to be aware of when when Brother Hightower was talking about being naive. We cannot be naive in the Lord's work. We have to seek out proof and we have to follow that path. And we cannot allow ourselves, regardless of how many people know someone, like someone, work with someone, whatever the relationship is, it cannot affect our adherence to the truth. And so he saw that situation, it was an easy call to make. But that's the kind of thing that is pervasive throughout the brotherhood. We have to make sure that we're not a part of it. Fellowship and lectureships. One of the things that I know a few years ago, I was in Lubbock, Brother was there, uh, in, in uh, where is it? That tall, grubby, grouchy man. <laughs> and Brother Dub was there. But today, we're here. And that tells a lot about us. Because we've seen the evidence. We know they can't go and speak on a lectureship program and associated with the people that you're going to be speaking with. You can't go and speak and not be associated, be in fellowship with the congregation who's holding that meeting. I recount to you right now, Carl and I had, because a lot of the stuff's in the book, you can read that, so I want to tell you some of these stories. Conversation I had with an elder in the San Francisco Bay about an upcoming meeting with Dave Miller. And I sat down with this brother and I said to him, I said, I understand that you're having Dave Miller come and speak. He said, yes, that's right. I said, what do you think about the controversy surrounding this Dave Miller? He said, I don't know anything about him. I don't read any of those publications. <laughs> I said, you don't read Contending for the Faith? You don't read The Defender? You don't read any of those? I said, you don't read any of these? He said, no, those are, those are negative. I said, well, don't you think an elder of the congregation, that you have a responsibility, not only a responsibility to the congregation over the, which you oversee, but a, uh, uh, a responsibility to God, to protect the flock. And here he is. He's an elder in the congregation. I, I said, have you spoken to Dave Miller? He said, no. Have you contacted him? Have you tried to contact? The congregation just decides that he's going to come and speak. And you're an elder there. He was installed as an elder after the decision made, making it even more incumbent upon him to follow up. Who is coming into, as they say in the, in the basketball, who is coming into my house? I cannot imagine the elders here spring allowing someone to come in and start having some idea of who that person is. If they did, you should show them the door. Because they are not overseeing the flock. They are not taking heed in the way the bond places that responsibility upon them. Brother Brown said that this is serious. It is serious. You know what? It's dead serious. And the circumstances that we find ourselves in where, you know, they are uh, marginalized. We are, we are not balanced. Some of the words they use is, is balanced. Obviously, the, the opposite of that is unbalanced. And I asked, I said, well, what you, uh, I said, I'm not going to try to tell you what to do, but maybe you should uh, take a little bit of time and go onto that Brown Trail Truth uh, website. Maybe you should take a look at this CD. Maybe you should do some investigation. I knew that they weren't going to change their minds. 
couldn't decide whether it was simply carelessness or a lack of concern for truth that led him to even feel that way in the beginning. When you ask someone to come on a lecture, what does that say? It should say without a doubt, it does say without a doubt, that you are in fellowship with that. It is impossible to have someone on a, fellowship, on a lectureship and not be saying that you are have fellowship with that person. When Paul spoke to the elders of Ephesus, Acts chapter 20, verses 8 through 30, his charge was to take heed to themselves and to all the flock. Holy Spirit had pronounced a responsibility upon that leadership, upon all leaderships. That word take heed means, of course, to seriously, and we think about the seriousness with which, with which we should take the scriptures. To guard against the dangers that any congregation can face. The men that you have who are in positions of, of responsibility here, the work. I always describe it as a work rather than an office. I know it is an office, but it's a work. Elders work. And they work to protect the flock from false teaching, from false teachers, false doctrine. They stay up on what goes on in the brotherhood so that when you have lectureships, that the people who brought in to preach, to teach, to speak before you are found. I was sitting there speaking with an elder who was about to unleash Dave Miller on their congregation. Had not spoken with him. Certainly not going to read anything negative about the man. And so he was certainly, knowingly or not, himself now in fellowship with You ask yourself about fellowship and lectureships. Who sends these invitations? Before we decide to go and speak, all of these brethren here who received invitations, before deciding to go and speak, who is sending the invitation? Is this a sound congregation? Are these brethren faithful? Do they stand for truth? That means that there's a responsibility, a certain diligence on the part of those who speak to find out where they're going and, and who else might, might be there and what types of things have gone on there in the past, what things go on there in the future. A young fellow who had been involved with <clears throat> Apologetics Press, Brad Harris. Brad, at one point, we had invited some years ago to come and speak in San Mateo, and we had to stop just a few days before the lectureship began. We told him, that's okay, he's not coming. We said, if you can't separate yourself from Dave Miller, if you can't separate yourself from Apologetics Press, we will not have you here in San Mateo. We got calls from brethren in the area that said, well, you know, uh, we support Brad Harrop. Did you know we support him? I, I won't tell you exactly what I said, but it didn't really matter. <laughs> we have to stand for what's right. Against all odds, it really didn't matter to that little shepherd boy, David, that, that, Goliath, was a, uh, that Goliath was a lot bigger than he was really didn't matter to him that the odds seemed to be against him. What he knew was God was being blasphemed. He was going to do something about it. We're going to have to take down the Davids, I mean the Goliaths. We're going to have to down. And it really doesn't matter what's going to take us. It's going to take the, the work of all of us where the bad boy ain't to come down. And they may be too proud. They may be too arrogant. They may be too selfish about themselves and their positions, their locations, or whatever it is associated with, but they must come down. They must humble themselves and repent. You can't be afraid in this battle. Someone asked me this afternoon, don't you, don't you ever get 
I think the world was depressed. I said, I never get depressed. I said, you just have to fight that battle. You have to go in every day. You have to look around and you have to see who's going to stand with the Lord who's not. You have to decide to take a soul shield. You have to decide to go into that battle and worry about taking prisoners. Can I participate in a lectureship if I'm going there to rebuke error? That was a question that came up. The question came up it was regarding uh, uh, Gary Summers at the time, one of the members in our congregation, uh, whom we have we had some difficulties with. He's no longer there. Wanted to know how can Gary Summers speak at shirts in 2005, right for contending for the faith and for the faith? This was a person who just went about wildly making allegations, and we said, well, you have to ask the person. You can't just make an assumption. You have to ask the person. You have to find out. You have to You can't just continue to. That example this afternoon should teach people something about doing some investigative work, I think. So I got an email. Actually, Keith was the one who helped me to get that patient from Dub. That Gary went to this particular uh, lectureship in order to expose and teach against error. That's a dangerous one because of the way that other people may look at that. They may not know that that's why you went. They may say you with the people who were there. And many times, that's exactly what they're going to do. They'll see your name. They'll see Dale's name. They'll know the uh, false teachers or liberals or uh, the group now is so big it's sort of like a stew. <laughs> and they say, well, I thought Dub was sound. Why is he there? So we always have to be very careful about where we go because the association is going to be made. If they see your name on a lectureship, you will be associated with the people that are there. They will make that application. It was 3-3. How can two walk together except they be in agreement? So we have to be careful of that. We always have to look. We have to do our homework. And that's the kind of thing that we want to keep in our in forming our minds, that idea. What about brotherhood publications? A lot of those. Most of those you read are probably negative. <laughs> you know, if you want to be tuned, then I suggest you nowhere else, because when you are contending for the faith, isn't that what Jude said? Jude said, I would love to talk to you, brethren, about the wonderful beauties of one's salvation. I would love to be able to, to spend some time discussing that. But what I have to talk to you about now is contending for the faith once delivered to the saints. I'm so glad to see this up here. And I hope that's how you feel. Because this publication is, is one of the few that continues to expose error, that continues to do as it from its very inception. You know, many, many years ago, and you, of course, knew him better than I did, Ira Wright, he was a cantankerous man. <laughs> But what I did was he warned the brethren. He warned, 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 warned about the upcoming tides of liberalism. And the brethren said, oh, Ira, you're too negative. And all those things that he warned us about came true. The good brethren here at Spring and Brother Brown, they warning us, warning us, warning us, along with Brother Hatcher and others about this, this new tolerance. I'm going to tell you, I've been, I've been living in the midst of tolerance for about 30 years. You live in San Francisco, that's all they say. 
You know, be tolerant. You know, you've got everything going on out there. If you can think about it, they are doing it. And see, in the brotherhood, that's what the idea is now. Tolerance. Let's be tolerant. That happened 15 years ago. Doesn't matter how long ago it was, if they haven't repented of sin, they're still in sin. And we have to contend, as Brother Brown understands, for the faith. Something to fight for, something really to be, I hate to use this word because it's always used negatively in the Bible, but we have to be proud, in a way, fight for what's right. <laughs> he must be coming to ask me where I want to eat. <laughs> and, and that's the thing that we have to do. When we think about the association, the financial support of a work, we have to look behind the scenes. We have to see who, who involved with it, who's overseeing it, what is their relationship. Because we, through our stewardship, are then in fellowship with them. The same thing having to do with not just the, the financial support of work, but, but whether we go and speak lectureship. There is no way possible that any of the men, any of the brethren here, could not in some way be associated, be thought of as in fellowship, that they went to speak with either the spiritual sword or the apologetics or whatever other, the Memphis school of print, all of those you will then be associated by going you are announcing an acceptance of fellowship certainly when writing for brotherhood publications and I think Gary Summers about one of the articles that he had written because it found its way in a publication he really hadn't anticipated at that time and then to to talk about how he had trusted that someone uh, had the material and, and wouldn't place it on a certain place, but he did. And the same thing that we say about financial support, the same thing that we say about speaking on lecture, same holds true for the articles that you write. Where does that, where does that article appear? If it appears to an article by Rubel Shelley, would you be proud of that? If it appears, uh, if it appears next to an article by Dave Mill, be associating yourself from him? No. The casual reader, the person who up that publication, doesn't matter what magazine it is, what publication it is, if they see your name next to his or hers or whomever it is that that's in error, and you are sitting next to them, they're going to associate you with that point of view. So what do we do? I was going to use that verse from Ephesians 5 and 11, but I think it's been used about 30 times. But it never runs out. I have no fault with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. When we talk about what we have to suffer, to do right. I found myself in a situation a few years ago. It's one of those painful situations and perhaps some of the brethren here have also themselves in, in some of the circumstances. My brother-in-law had fallen away. And I read the letter of withdrawal in the congregation where my wife and her brother were sitting right in the audience. That was hard. But he had left his first love. He had left the Lord. And we had to apply church discipline to my wife's brother, to my brother-in-law's brother. There was no way around it. When someone is in sin, there can be no respect to person. You can't try to decide a way around it. You can't try to figure out a way to wiggle out of it. You have to do what the Lord requires of you. 
So hard decisions are being made. Sometimes they involve our best friends. Sometimes they involve family members, longtime schoolmates. It doesn't matter who it is. You better come down on the Lord's side, on the side of truth. Have no fellowship with the works of darkness. No matter who it is, reprove them. If you're here this evening and you are not a member of the Lord's body, but you are learning about Jesus Christ and the gospel, this will be an excellent time for you to think more seriously about your soul's salvation. This will be an excellent time to think about doing what's right. We're talking, this whole lectureship is about doing what's right. Being in the right relationship with God. If you are not a Christian, you need to think very seriously about becoming one. And if you have had the opportunity to hear the gospel and you believe without a doubt that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you know that you need to repent. You need to make a change in your life. You need to go away from the works of darkness into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. You need to make a confession. Romans 10, 9, four men, not just standing with people here this evening, but walking in newness of life, being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. If you are a member of the Lord's church and you also have departed from the path of righteousness and in some public way have disparaged the Lord and his church. This is the time to be reconciled. This is the time to make it right with him. Would you come? We stand and sing.